Hey, Tyler, what's up? Hey, how man, how are you? I'm big good. Red bears, big red bears. <laughs> right? My God, yeah. When, uh, that's uh, when Sasha said you were a Cornell grad. I was like, all right, I'm in. I don't care, I'm in. Yeah, right? So, you yeah. got to stick together. Yeah, we got to stick together. I saw that. I was like, look at Ty, Ty, Ty over here. <laughs> man, you are so hilarious. You're like, you're like, you're like, I love your humor. It's like dry, but it's also like, a, you know, I, it's over, over the top. And then your inspirations and the people you look up to from Chris Rock to Dave, Lash, Dave Chappelle. Um, it's so cool because like those are people I love to watch, including, you know, Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy, a lot of those guys as well. But I was like, this guy is hilarious. I was like, this is only, this is definitely a Cornelian. You're definitely a Cornelian. You know, you got that that, that, that that street humor, but you live in, you know, you used to that Ithaca world. So <laughs> no, so no, it's so it's funny, yeah, because it's so it's so true. Like, uh, there's a we're a certain breed, the the Cornell the Cornell people. We've go, we've gone through the the harshest winters mankind can know. So you know, just with that, it makes you shapes you. You know, <laughs> right? It does shape you. And like you know, and people don't really understand how beautiful that college campus is with those walking trails and those gorges going through the you know the, the waterfalls and the campus. It's like, where do we? I mean, like, it was like a whimsical avatar experience, so to speak. <laughs> oh, for sure, totally. And you, in your studies, you, you, you know, I was IRLARI. So, what was your studies there? You you were in media studies, right? Yeah, media studies. So I was on so, the so I played. I was on the soccer team. Um. So yeah. So I was uh, I was the captain of the soccer team. Um, and did media studies, but my entire, I did media studies because I always did film growing up and I was like, I really want to stay in film. But, uh, in reality, I really wanted to play professional soccer. I mean, that was, that was the, that was the dream. And I got, um, so after my senior year, we went like, I think 17 and one and something We're like fifth in the country. We won Ivy, Ivy league championship. We were like, really, you know, we had like five or six guys that were like looking to go pro. And so I was like, okay, let's go. Um, did the whole pro thing, went to a bunch of combines and then was about to like sign on to a team uh, in upstate New York. So I played a little bit with the Rochester Rhinos, tried to get catch on there and then went to the Syracuse Silver Knights, which is indoor pro. And then right when I was like, the season was about to start, snapped my ankle. That was it. Career over. So like, I, I kind of got the dream, like the, the, the pro sports dream for a second. Um, but it was so short lived that like, it caused me to kind of scramble because I was like still at Cornell when I broke my, when I, when I shattered my ankle, I was still living in Ithaca uh, with one of my ex teammates who was also playing professional soccer. So um, I was kind of in Ithaca. I, my job was pro soccer, but now my job was nothing. Um, and it was definitely a scramble for like five years to be like, okay, I'm going to coach. I'm going to become a personal trainer. I'm going to do all these things. And I just couldn't figure out what it was I wanted to do. Um, and then, uh, started doing project management when I moved back to Philadelphia and I was like I guess I'll do this you know because I was kind of risk adverse you know what I mean like you know and you are someone who's an entrepreneur and it started something and you know it's a risk so I was kind of risk adverse I was like I had this dream it was taken from me I got injured I don't want to have a dream ever again you know what I mean like it was kind of like that so I I kind of did the more traditional route not that there's anything wrong with it it's just I, I didn't really like my day-to-day -day. and so the content creation became like a creative outlet and it wasn't until I kind of had some really good people around me um you know kind of being like you can do this like you can make this a career and so I put my notice in moved to LA and tried to make a run at it so it, it was it was super like convoluted but yeah it was media studies because I knew I wanted to fall back into it but the plan was to fall into it after my soccer career so I thought I had some time to figure it out uh and so when that time became instantaneous. I was like, ah, crap. So it took a second. Can you um can you break it down to people? Because I don't think people really understand like how intense the Ivy League program at Cornell is. It's a Division One school. My roommate was on the basketball team. People don't really understand that. Um, hold on one second. There's a siren in the background. I don't know if you can hear that. Oh yeah, no worries. Life in the Bronx. I feel you. <laughs> but um, yeah. So basically, um. You know, you guys have tutors, you, you know, they fly you out, they bus you places. You got to get up at three o'clock in the morning to be somewhere else. It's just crazy. You're taking full classes. You, you know, it's a rigorous 
you know, a rigorous program, a regular, a rigorous athletic program. And then on top of that, you have to, your, your, your scholar program, your scholastic program, which is where you, you're at an Ivy League school. Like how intense was that for you, you know, um, juggling the, the academics with the, with, these, with, the, with the athleticism? Honestly, I think it was like the, the balance of sports and such a, like you said, such a rigorous education is probably the biggest thing I got out of it. Like, I mean, to be, there's not one class that taught me more than, than that, you know, understanding like, Hey, you are going to have the same normal, I think it was 15 credits, right? So five classes, you know, two, three classes a week, all this, you know, and obviously, you know, how midterms were and finals were, where they were completely, you know, overwhelming, but at the same time, you have a full-time job doing sports, right? So you have, you have game film for a couple hours, you have practice for a couple hours, you lose, you lose two nights, three nights a week for games. So, you know, you have to travel. Okay. We're going to play Brown. It's a six hour bus ride. You go play Brown. You stay overnight. You wake up, you do a walkthrough, you go play uh, the game. You come back at night, Sunday, like Sunday morning, 2 AM. And now you have all your work to do the weekend for that weekend, but you also have practice on Sunday. You have to do game film on Sunday. You have to do a walk, like another walkthrough. You have to game on Tuesday. So it, it was very much like, you had to compartmentalize your time perfectly or you just were never going to get by. Um, and I, so I think that now working for myself, doing content creation where again, like I don't have a boss per se, like I can say, you know what, I'm not going to post today, but you do that one too many times, you, you know, this falls apart. So I think that what I learned from Cornell more than anything is that work life balance, like understand that, like, okay, I have this time set aside for like classes I have three hours here. So that's going to be homework time because then I have to go to a lift and then I got to do a practice. So, so that's the biggest thing I gained from it because, you know, the actual information I pulled in from a lot of these, these classes weren't as relevant as just that life lesson uh, was. And before I forget, your last name is Reagan. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's Regan, R E G I. Regan, Regan, see, I Regan. knew, I knew Yeah, I, I, I was, I was hoping you was like, you know, some some president's like grandson or something. <laughs> no, nah, I wish that'd be dope. If I was, if I was the president's grandson, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be something. You get a medal, a medal of entertainment. But yeah, no, right. That's, right. That's so cool that you broke it down like that because you're talking about time management and being punctual, and those are all the things we need in our everyday lives to succeed you know, especially in the entrepreneurial space. And um, you have to also realize, and I'm sure you you have at one point, like, I'm not your average, you know, Tyler, you know? And I'm sure you were th thinking to yourself, like, not only am I, you know, I'm like an athletic star, I'm also a scholastic star. And I've been very blessed that I have an opportunity to pick and choose what I want to do when I want to do it. And if it comes a little earlier, I still can do it. I have that as an opportunity. How does that feel? Like, how did that feel? Because you, you, a lot of people don't have that. A lot of people don't have that. Like you have, you, you still can be a sports announcer. You still can be anything you want to do in that world. You could be a physical therapist. You could be a freaking coach. You could do, any, we're not talking about little league. You could be like a, 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 you know, you could be, you already know, like there's some real possibilities and opportunities for you, but how does that feel? Because you have to realize that that's a big thing for you. Like you, you know, that's not going to fall back on. You have opportunities. You have a network of people at your beck and call, including myself, that are here for you. When we find out you're a Cornelian, it's like, oh, you know, we descend on you with our claws. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, I, I try not to think about it, honestly, because I kind of look, I like to treat life like I have a plan A and no plan B, because I feel like that's the only way to do something. That being said, when I was making the decision to leave my project management job, which, you know, was a decent salary, it was, it was like, I didn't have to, like, I could make a career out of that and plenty of people do, and it could have been great. I would say Cornell gave me the privilege of being able to take a chance because if I had tried and failed, and this was something that I spoke to my parents about at length when they were like, you know, you're going to quit your job, move to LA. And again, they were very supportive. They were very open to the idea, but they're like, you know, do you think you're like, you know, what do you think? Are you going to be utilizing your education? And I actually use it more than I ever expected to. But one of my main points was my education is what's allowing me to take this chance because I do have that network and I do have that uh, kind of that knowledge that I gained from Cornell. So I think Cornell 
gave me so much uh, confidence to try and potentially fail, um, which I think is is a really big thing um, for with any uh, you know college education. You have you have this fallback of that network. You have this fallback of that degree where like you can take a chance and you can try something. And worst case scenario, you still have this this education to fall back on and this and this degree to fall back on. So I do think that I kind of looked at it that way. Um, but then, like I said, I use what I learned at Cornell a lot more than I even expected to in this in this uh, space. So so it, it kind of was twofold. And then you already started in a, in a career path with a, a trajectory where I know and I've met people who are making millions of dollars in the project management space. Like logistics and project management is a lot of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. But I never, you know, you're doing it all the time. You don't even know that you're doing, a, you know, you're doing it. It's like, what the, you know, I put together small yeah. teams all the time, but you, 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 you've learned how to do that. And then you start working in that career path. Like, can you break down what a project manager actually does? Um, what, what to expect when they first graduate from college and the earnings potential? For project management, mean, uh, yeah, I mean, you can, if you have a decent background in it, I mean, you can, there are major companies that look for project managers starting salary 60,000, 65,000. That's starting. You can get up to 70, 75 pretty quick. You can get way into the six figures within five years. I mean, th there is a lot of earning potential in the project management space. And obviously it depends. Project management is a very, vague term because you're a project manager in an engineering project it's going to pay differently than a project manager in another space so it really the cool thing about project management is you can you can do say hey i really like organizing teams and being that team leader but i also am really excited about this particular more drilled in specific topic and therefore i can be a project manager for that type of thing and so you know like i said like while it wasn't for me there's a lot of really um, great openings and potential openings that are in that project management space. And, you know, I've had producers, I've had, you know, you know, when I'm on set and I have camera guys and actors and stuff like that, like I'm a project manager at that moment. Right. You, so, so I still use it. And I still think that, you know, learning uh, the, at least the basics of how to run and manage a group uh, with different group dynamics and with different personalities is such a, key component to to just surviving in any industry even if it's not project manager even if you're just part of a team it's just good to have that information and it's good to have that knowledge so i'm really happy that i actually did it even though it didn't end up being my end-all be-all goal yeah i think that it's very apparent when i click my phone over or i took my smart device and i put it onto google classic and i see that really it's like tyler you have like an infinite amount of projects. It's so, it's crazy. It's like a sea abyss of like funny skits and they're, humor, they're humorous and they're, and they're, and they're, and they're, they, they tap on universality and, you know, globalization and what's going on in the marketplace. And it's like, and then it's like, you're from Philly and it's like, where did this guy get this energy from? It's like, you have such an urban, like, you look like you're from suburbs, but it's like, no, 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 no. Like, tell me, let me go, let me see what this background is about. Like, can you tell us about how, how, what was it like growing up as Tyler Regan? Because I'm like, he got a little, you got a little edge, you know, you get, you like, get a little black on you or something. Like, <laughs> cause you know, you're funny as shit. I mean, you'd be like, the, your be likes are so funny. If anyone's ever seen his be likes, I mean, we've all seen you like on TikTok. I love TikTok because they shadow ban you a little bit, they'll throttle you down. But it's like when you got an account on TikTok, you don't know what the kind of account you have because it's the sky's the limit on TikTok a lot of times. Um, and I've seen you and I'm like, oh my God, I love this guy. Like I never knew half the shit about you that I know now. And I'm like so happy for you because you you're just transcending. You just keep on transcending and transcending. It's just, you're like a phoenix. You, you know, a phoenix, you, you know, you're never going to fall. Yeah, it's just so, it, but it's like, how did you, where'd you get this little edge from? Because you have this little, you know, this little cool kid thing going on. It's like, you know, you're a nerd, but you're like a cool nerd. Like, which, how did, who gave you this information? Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, keep going. No, I'm loving it. No, uh, no, I appreciate all that. I mean, so when it comes to, when, so growing up in Philly, I mean, I played basketball and soccer. Those are the two things. I grew up playing basketball in the inner city that's where i might and i was very ingrained uh from a pretty young age 
uh, with at least seeing, you know, because I, I did grow up in Philly, but I lived on the outskirts of Philly. It was still within Philadelphia, but it was certainly not like inner city. All of my friends playing basketball, they were, they were in the, the thick of it. They were in center city. They were in different neighborhoods in Philly. So I got to see kind of every walk of life from a very young age. And also my parents, props to them, they, you know, they took me to different countries, different cities, different, I got to see every kind of person growing up. And it was, you know, it was stilled on in me uh, at a very young age for my parents, like, hey, you are lucky that we get to do all this. You are lucky that you are going, that you have, uh, you know, you want to do a film class and we're able to say, yeah, I was in third grade. I did my first film class or first grade. I did my first film class. They're like, that is a privilege that you get to do that. Like that is something that you, that you don't, that you, you need to understand, like, don't live in a bubble, understand that that is something that you're lucky to have. And I think they did such a good job. And for me and, and my, my sisters to understand that, you know, we were living in a privileged life. Um, and I think that as I grew up, I still had to see it for myself and learn it for myself. And I had to get to a place where I am now, where I am fully aware of everything uh, that, you know, my upbringing, my, the color of my skin, my gender, like all these things like do create like a world that's specific to me, just like a different person walking down the street, they have a different reality. And so when I started making content for a while, I wanted to kind of just be an escape for the people watching me. And it was like, you know what? I'm not going to touch on politi like political topics. I'm not going to touch on social topics because everyone's talking about it and I want to be an escape. And then I want to say around 2018, uh, you know, shit started happening in the world. You know, there was a, you know, 2018, 2019, you know, Trump becoming president. And then in 2020, George Floyd, I remember being a very distinct thing where I was like, I need to comment on this. And I feel like my hand was almost forced where I was like, staying silent is just as bad as actually doing the actions. Like you need to, like, uh, like the lines have been drawn. You need to choose a side and staying silent is you're choosing this side. And I was like, I'm not on this side. So, so on one hand, I felt uh, that unfortunately the the landscape of our country and the world forced me to kind of be more specific about my opinions on things um that being said i still want to make sure that you know not every video is trying to preach not every video is trying to make a point because some things can just be funny um but you know i think that pointing out you know and this is a lot going back to dave Chappelle, going back to chris rock like pointing out truth can be funny you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are uh, making a joke about something because it's not a big deal. I think that you make a joke about something because a lot of the shit is just like a traumatic and like this is how certain people deal with stuff. So I think that, you know, it's been a bit of a journey to figure out the right way to find my voice and the right way to uh, even understand and wrap my head around my own like place in the world being a straight white male like coming from uh, a decent upbringing having a two a two parent home like so i think that you know throughout life i've been trying to figure out how do i understand this not try to understand where everyone else is coming from per se not trying to be like i get it cuz you don't get it you know no one understands someone else's reality but um, but still having a very open mind to uh, to just understand, almost understand that you don't understand it, you know, and, 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 and being OK with that and being OK that you don't get it. And that, you know, just because I find something funny and this person doesn't find it funny doesn't mean they're wrong, doesn't necessarily mean I'm wrong. Uh, it's all in the approach. It's all in how you. How, it's, it's a respect thing. I, I really think it, it all it all at the end of the day, it goes down to a respect thing. Um, and I, and I get that really from starting from my parents. Wow. That's awesome that you acknowledge that. Um, and speaking of which, like Cornell is of the, uh, you know, it's a school of first, you know, Ezra Cornell, um, you know, it's just their background ethnically and the, as a founder and then Cornell having such amazing, uh, 
history within the African American fraternal organizations like Alpha Phi Alpha, which I'm a member of. Shout out. <laughs> Shout out to my Alpha chapter brothers. <laughs> there you go. But um, but yeah, and I was the president of the Black and Latino Greek Council, and I worked with the dean of students, and I also worked with the Panhellenic uh, president of that, that council, and the senior class uh, senior class gift committee. Were you a part of the leadership of the school as well? Because I feel like your energy is like you kind of on. You know, you like I'm like you were you a mover and shaker we were doing there. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, so at, at Cornell, the only leadership committee I was in was I was the captain of the soccer team. That was my leadership committee. I wasn't, we weren't even allowed to be part of a fraternity. It was a team role. Um, so I, I wish, I, it's, it's not a regret per se, but I wish I got more involved with some other things. It's just, I, the time did not exist. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so the, the leadership, uh, the leadership committee I was on was, was the soccer team, you know, and that was, that was, that was it. Fair enough. And you know, that's a lot of leadership <laughs> involved. I'm sure. <laughs> oh, for you know, sure. Trying to, lead, trying to lead a team of guys that everybody's, you know, chasing after, especially right now with the whole world cup being such a, a, a you know, magnanimous event. Um, what's your, um, I was going to ask you just to roll back a little bit, but I had to ask you that question for everyone who loves sports. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to ask you, do you recall the time that you first landed in a new environment with your parents when you guys traveled abroad? Do you remember, do you remember how old you were and what was the first thing you smelled? So the, the, the absolute first international trip I can think of was France. I was maybe, they might yell at me for being wrong about this, seven, maybe? I'm going to say seven. Uh, it's a ballpark. Um, and I smelled cigarette smoke, <laughs> like, immediately. I remember, and I remember it because I, my mom said, this is the city of what, guys? And it's Paris is the city of lights. And I said, is it the city of smoking? And that was my, that was my response because that's, that, and I distinctly remember that. I don't, don't know exactly how old I was, but I'll have to, I'll have to confirm. I was, I was like maybe seven or eight. Like I was young. Wow. I'm, I'm over here just laughing because you're so funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, you know, I grew up in Detroit and just my first smell was when I came, when I came to New York. <laughs> I feel like New York was one of the first international cultural cities that I came up mm -hmm. That, that I embraced it. What I remember when I had moved here at 22 was a smell of piss and urine in the train station and seeing all those rats. That's, I was that's like, New York. I that's you know, New I York. Like, I was like, those rats are, I was like, are those cats? I mean, at first I, I went up to one of the rats. I was like, give me a little baby. You know, because the yeah. rats are so cute and cuddly. It's, you know, some of them on the west, you know, west side or the village area can be kind of cute. When you get a little, uh, you know, when you get a little higher up and things, they get a little smaller, I feel. But they, they, they getting fed downtown. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, they get fed. My sister lives in Brooklyn and she has <laughs> on her street, there's some there's some raccoon sized rats. <laughs> they, get, they get big. They get huge. So, so, okay, so you grew up in Philly, you grew up around basketball, you grew up in sports, that explains, explains the cool kid jock side of you. And then you went to Cornell, so get it, you're smart, you know how to put together teams, you well-traveled, culture, had a passport when you are seven, and now fast forward to this new sensation on TikTok that be like, like, how did you come up with this concept? Be like, it's like, you're so stupid. I'll be like laughing because it's like, just like the driest humor, but it's like your Karens, your um, Cheesecake Factory, so true. Cheesecake Factory is like, come on, Cheesecake Factory. You know, I'm ordering, I'm ordering from the, um, from the bar menu for happy hour and you still taking three hours. You know what yep. I'm saying? <laughs> yep. But, but I mean, like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I feel like, uh, it's like, so the, the dry humor definitely comes from, so I watched, a lot of those comedians that like i said but i also watched a lot of monty python so it was a british humor and british humor is inherently a lot more dry um so i think that that's where that kind of combination comes from uh a lot of monty python uh being very very dry kind of subtle humor um so that's i feel like a big player in that kind of weird combination that you spoke of um and then in terms of the actual videos i mean some videos, I always say like some videos come really easily and I'm like, I have an experience. I'm like, that was weird. Let me write a script about that. And then there's sometimes that I'm like, you know, 
I just, I kind of have to think, I'm like, all right, what am I going to do a video about today? I feel like I've done every company. Is there another company that, and I had to rack my brain and be like, where have I gone lately? Um, but I found that like, if you're constantly on the lookout for just absurdity in everyday scenarios, you'll find it. I mean, we live in an absurd world. So like, I feel like, you know, if you just, it, it's changed my brain a little. It's like how I look at everything and realize like things that we every day deal with, you know, a lot of them are nuts. A lot of them are absurd and they just have become normal. And so I like poking fun. It doesn't mean like, you know, I make Cheesecake Factory video making fun of Cheesecake Factory. I still go to Cheesecake Factory. I like Cheesecake Factory. It's good. Like, I mean, it's not like poking fun is like, I'm, I don't like it or I'm negative about it. Most of the things I talk about, I like, there's one or two things, but you'll, you can tell with the tone. Like if I really don't like something, the tone is slightly different. Like it's a little bit more cutting. Um, and you see that with like some of the videos about like workplace life, right? Like the maternity leave videos, like where I'm like, hey, maternity leave laws are messed up. Like they, they suck, they need to be better. Like you can watch that video and go, okay, he actually feels this way. You know, same thing with some of the ones when it comes to um, current events and injustices and stuff like that. Like you can tell the tone is slightly different than when I'm talking about Taco Bell. Like it just, you know, cause I make a Taco Bell video. I like Taco Bell, There's nothing wrong with that. Like, you know, so I do think that finding absurdity and things that you like is super fun. Like being like, wow, I really like this, but wow, it's a weird concept if you think about it. Like, you know, so that's super fun to just kind of go around and live your life and try to understand how weird our existence can be. Um, you know, especially just corporate wise. Well, I mean, with you, it's like, you probably don't even know what you're doing, but you're attracting so many, so much different energy. Like you have so much different energies. Like you have this, this nerd energy. Then you have this jock energy. It's like, people are probably like, I want to ask him a question. I don't, you know, <laughs> like, you know, and the girls are probably like, I want to ask him how. So it's just like so much different energy with you. You're attracting so much different energy. And then you have this European um, energy hovering over you. So it's like, it's like because you've, you're so well traveled, but it's like it's like I don't feel like it, I don't feel like it's it. I, I know what you're saying because it's, it's like I have I feel the same way when it comes to a, a loss for words in terms of how to describe it. But I don't want anybody to ever take from what you're saying that is weird or awkward. It's just it's it's because you're just so well you you're just you, you're just you, and it's like you possess something that a lot of people just don't. They can't put a finger on it. It's je ne sais quoi. It's like you ha you have a you have a characteristic that you know that that people are uh, attracted to and you don't know why and it's like and then, you know and yourself you, you you know but when but you're embracing it and i think that's awesome that you're embracing that energy of that this newfound human being that you you found inside of yourself this inner being but um are you just i with having found that and you see the success um of what is going on with your life it's crazy what's next? Like what's on your, what's on your, what's on your next page? Because are you going to do the comedy circuit? Because I mean, you know how to set up a joke. I mean, you, you can see it, you can hear it in the way you, you present things, but are you going to do the comedy club circuit? Like ahas and all the Carolinas and all that stuff, or what's like, are you going to try that? So I feel like the, maybe with the comedy circuit, like that's a possibility. It's something that I've kind of tossed around in my brain for a while, but because I came, so I, like, like I said, my first film class was when I was like in first grade or something. Like I, I had, my parents got me a book called 501 directors and like, I have this big, and I still have it. Like I wanted to be a director growing up. Like if I wasn't a soccer player, it was film. I made, I, I my, my best friend, Jeff, who is still my best friend, we would spend, we would stay up till four in the morning with the camcorder and edit in camera and make like stupid. We made eight and a half mile when eight miles out. We made parodies of just like random stuff. Like that was just what we did. And it was like, it was, I just loved it. So because I came from kind of a film side and ended up in comedy, I feel like I still want to always, I, I feel like I lean more towards film and less towards comedy. Like I feel like the two have met nicely but if I was to, when I, when I make that move, I think I want to keep doing comedy, but I want to do it in a film way, which kind of is why I haven't done stand up. It's, it's cause I, I, I have a passion for content. I have a passion for film. So if I was to do a comedy thing, I would definitely do it in a way that wasn't a traditional way. I don't know what that would be, but it would be a way, it would find a way to bridge the gap a little bit between comedy and, and, and film. Um, 
but that sounds super like pretentious and meta. So I haven't, I haven't done it. <laughs> um, but then uh, most likely, I think I really want to write like a web series, a mini series. I want to, I want to start, I look at like what, what the workaholics guys did. And, and I look at that and I go like, that's, that's great. They were able to make like this for themselves. Another person that I think is an absolute, you know, God is Donald Glover. I mean, he's able to kind of do everything. The dude is so talented. He's able to say, you know what? I want to act. So let me act. Hey, I want to write. So let me write Atlanta. Hey, I want to, I want to rap. So let me, let me, I'm Childish Gambino now. Like, I mean, he's able to do anything he wants to do. So that's like super inspiring to me um, because, you know, as someone that thinks of themselves as a creative, like being able to have so many avenues open to you at all times is really exciting. And seeing someone actually be able to do it successfully like Donald Glover is, is it kind of keeps me going. Um, so, you know, I think if I had to guess my next step is, is a web series, mini series, try to get something picked up and try to do, um, take these characters, not necessarily the Karens and the, and the very specific characters, but take, this like approach to writing and make it a bigger scale with actors that is a 30 minute episode rather than a 45 second episode and try to and try to scale it up i think i have a great idea for you too just listening to you i was like wow um sometimes i watch some of the comedy specials on netflix and some of them are shot so you know there's there's so the cinematography is amazing Mm -hmm. so it's like it is it's very film-esque very film-esque and i feel like some of the conversations we're having is are, are so like down to earth and real. And it's like, not what I would expect from, I'm sure a lot of people are like, that's not what I would expect from a TikToker. So it's like, no, he's not your average TikToker. And we're not talking about TikTok. We're talking about real life here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about cigarette smoke. But I feel, like <laughs> exactly. you, I feel like with you though, it's like, I think that you could do something real special in the comedy club circuit. And I feel like you could probably do a, a comedy special where you can film it at one of those comedy clubs and just do it on your own terms, do it with your own material and then release it when you're ready. But I feel like, I feel like I want to hear some real shit. I want to hear some real shit and I want to hear some bull and I want to hear some, you know, some, some, some um, stuff I can't relate to, but it's like, you know, I want to hear something that's transparent and that that's cultural and that's educated and that makes some sense. Like that makes some sense. That's what I want to know. Mm-hmm. So I feel like if you were to take on that space, like a like a um, like a key and, and Jordan Peele, I feel like you could definitely do it. And I feel like I, you know, I think that a lot of people will watch it. I want to watch something like that. I want to watch something groundbreaking. Like so, if you if you if it doesn't have to be at a comic club, you can do it in your home, your home in your your in your bedroom for all I care. I just feel like if you can, the way you are right now, sitting in your truth is 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 interesting. And the way your videos they sit in the truth too, like you said. Case in point, your Karen videos. Are any of your Karen videos based on um, occurrence? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some of them, have, like some of them, have happened to a degree. I mean, there's a there's obviously uh, creative license to expand. Uh, but yeah, no. Some of them, some of them have happened. I mean, or I heard they've happened. Or some of them are based on you know stories you hear on the news, where it's like, oh, this Karen did this, called the cops on a family having a picnic, and blah blah blah. Like that's like those are things that happen, and I take that. I'm like, all right. How would that have gone? Like I wasn't there, but like let's pretend. Like let's 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 see if we can make this like an actual like a funny skit rather than a horrible woman being horrible, right? And so I kind of take those uh, news things and take it as a challenge. I'm like, can I make this funny? And so, and sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is no. So so a lot of them are based on real things. Most of them are not based on real things that I personally experienced, though one or two are with the Karen specifically. Um, I would say the other videos are things more often than not that I've experienced. Like, I feel like Karen's taken off, a, taken on a life of her own where I'm now kind of like, what would Karen do in this situation? Like my version of Karen versus like other Karen experiences. Like I, I feel like I, in my head, have a really strong sense of her personality as a character. So I'm able to now stick her in a situation and, and know how she would respond. Um, so those are becoming less and less based in reality. Uh, as time goes on, because I'm kind of like taking the character and just let putting setting her loose at this point. Um, but a lot of the other videos are much more grounded in my experiences. Yeah, and then speaking of which, those types of experiences, Kevin Hart had a movie with oh, um, with the guy that plays Blake, Wesley Snipes. Um, oh, yeah. Had- yeah, that was, yeah. I was, I did not expect that. I did not expect that. And that's what I'm saying for you. Like you have the emotional life and the ability and the intellectual capabilities and the manpower and the project management 
uh, expertise. <laughs> it all comes where together. You, where you can actually pull this shit off. You can pull it off. And I feel like I'll be, I'll be right. I, I'm sure everybody at Cornell will be right behind you. You know, us 20,000 people in county you know, on a year to year basis. I can't believe that so many people go to that school undergrad and grad. But it, it, um, but I feel like we'll be, we'll, we'll, we'll be like rooting for you because this is a space that we're not always in. And it's like, but that Kevin Hart movie, that Kevin Hart movie with that Wesley Snipes character and that, you know, that brother being a fuck up and him taking it, you know, always being the, the one that's always succeeding and the brother always in his, you know, the dark horse always in his um, shadow. It was just very beautiful, but it was very ugly. It was very surreal. And then it was like you being overtaken by your own demons all at the same time. Same thing with the Truman Show with, um, you know, Jim with, Carrey, yeah. yeah, Jim Carrey, yeah. that was unbelievable. And then at the end, yeah. he couldn't get out that bubble. I was like, what the, f-? you know, I was like, so it's like this. So like you have a lot of people who created this opera, these, these trails for you. And now you can walk on those trails or next to those trails or above or below those trails. The sky's the limit for you because you're part of the new age generation of young people who have access and who understand the access they have. And the under, they understand this new phenomenon called TikTok. So when it comes to your TikTok regimen and your schedule, how do you come up with those with those I mean with those time frames? Are you using just strictly your um, your dashboard analytics, or are you are you using your emotions sometimes when you push those videos off? Because I've seen you have some videos got million views and likes, and some that sixty thousand to twenty thousand, and there's another one that eight hundred thousand, three million. I'm like, who is this guy? Is you know it's like are you like you seem like a risk taker? So I, I feel like you have I feel like some of your videos are analytics, and some of them are like all about like you know comp- the uh, the country's climate and um and, and culture and where it's breaking news is kind of touching on but how do you do it normally so i definitely use analytics to understand certain things right so like it's like okay our video is doing like for example 45 second videos used to do really well for me now it's more like 35 second videos. So like I, I use analytics to understand some specifics about my videos, um, you know, but other than that, I kind of just, I, I feel like I always kind of have to have a finger on the pulse of my audience, but at the same time, understand that I'm doing these videos just as much for myself as for the audience, which is a really tough balance to strike. And it's the thing I always say to content creators that are trying to become content creators and they're just starting and they're like, what's the piece of advice? And it's always, if I could give one piece of advice, it would be make videos you enjoy. It's that simple. And I know it seems so basic, but I've seen so many people chase views. I've seen so many people try to make videos that they think other people will watch. The downside of that, obviously, uh, is, you know, I, I look at it, you know, it's almost like a worst case and best case scenario of each, of each situation, right? Like if you're making videos that you like, Worst case scenario is people don't watch them, but you're making videos you like and you're enjoying your time. Best case scenario are people watching them and you enjoy them. That's a win-win. If you're making videos that you don't enjoy, but you hope people are watching, worst case scenario, people aren't watching and you're doing things you don't want to do. Your absolute best case scenario is that people watch it and now you're forced to continue doing something you don't want to do. So like, you can't win in that scenario. Like, so if you look at it, like you don't want to be in a situation where you don't enjoy your day to day because that's the whole point of this. This is a hobby. And if you're able to make it a career and you're able to make, that's great. But for most people, it's going to be just an outlet. And I'm lucky that it gets to be both. It's my outlet and it's my job. But when I first started on YouTube, 2017, I researched, I said, okay, what's doing well? What keywords doing well? What's doing this? What's doing that? And I tried to make videos that were going to do well. And I get further and further and further away from myself in doing that because I was trying to do what this ever-changing YouTube algorithm wanted me to do. It wasn't until I got on TikTok during the pandemic, I was like trying to figure out what I want to do. And I was like, you know what? I want to just do skits. It's just me. I'm just going to do some skits. That's going to be fun. And it did terribly at first. People hated them. I don't know if people hated them, but they didn't get views, I should say. And eventually I found the right audience and now that's what I'm known for. And I'm lucky that that happened, but like, you know, I was much happier doing those videos when they weren't doing well than I was doing YouTube anyway. So like it worked out and obviously it was a little bit more pressure because this was my career. This was my income source, but you know, I 
really force myself at the time to do what I wanted to do. Like I wanted to be able to watch any one of my videos and go, that's funny. And I enjoy that, you know, so not to give some long winded answer to your question, you know, I do feel that I listen to analytics and if a video does poorly, or if I'm trying to start a new series and, the, and I do it and it doesn't work and people, it's not resonating with people, I might just say, oh, okay, I won't go back to that series. But for the most part, again, I try desperately and I'm not perfect, but I try desperately to make videos that I just find funny and that, you know, I have a weird sense of humor. And there are times that I'll be like, all right, there's four videos in a row that I really feel I'm going to do well. So this fifth video, let's go weird. Let's get, let's get real weird with it. It probably won't do well, but whatever it will do it. Right. And sometimes I'm right. And it does terribly. And sometimes I'm wrong and it does great. And it resonates. Like I did a video maybe two months ago, how they named Dick Sporting Goods. And it was a weird video. <laughs> it was, it was real weird. And I, and I wrote it maybe in five minutes. Cause I was like, I kind of like had it and I was like, oh my God. And I just started typing. I was like, this is weird as hell. I'm posting it. And it got what of like 2 million views. And I was like, I expected to get no views. I thought it was going to bomb. I thought it might get flagged. I thought like, but it did great. And it was like, wow, that's awesome. People, there's 2 million people out there that are just as weird as me. <laughs> like, so, so sometimes you're surprised when you take risks. So it's worth it. Yeah. I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you. You did that, everybody. You had every black woman say, how did I do that? I was like, oh my God. And it's so like, oh my God, how does it feel to like, like when people are like, they're emulating you, they're duetting you. That is so cool. Like I was like to a ton of black women duet you all the time. I'm like, oh my God, you're so loved by so many people. I was like, I didn't even know that was your voice. I didn't even know that was your voice. <laughs> I never did it your voice, but you hit it. You hit the you hit the nail on the head. Da -da -da -da. No pun intended. <laughs> but it's just so cool. It's so cool because you're like, you're like you. That's it's like wow. My question would be my my real question would be to you. So when it feels uncomfortable, is that when you know you got a hit on your hands? Not necessarily. I think that I've gotten at this point when I write something film it and edit it I'm able to know pretty closely how it will do I, I mean just because I at this point I, I can understand there's some there are some factors that you can't really put your finger on in terms of what makes a good video but there's times I look at it and I go it's good I can't tell what's missing but it's good and I know that's going to be a video that's fairly average and I'll try to fix it and sometimes I'm just like maybe I'm wrong. Like maybe I can't figure it out and I'll send it to some friends. Or I'll send it to my sister or someone or show my girlfriend and they'll be like, no, it's good. Or it feels slow or, you know, and then they help me kind of maybe like chop it down. But when I know, when I have a video and I edit it and I, and I see it and I know it's a hit, I usually, I usually know it. I'm like, nailed it. Like this will work. So, so it kind of just, it's a vibe. I wish I had like a more of a like solid reasoning of being like, oh, here we go. But it's, it's honestly just like, if I watch a video and it's 40 seconds and it doesn't feel like 40 seconds, I know it's a good video, you know? So like, you don't want it to feel long. You want to, you want it to move. You want it to, you know, and I feel like the videos that do the best are the ones that have a lot of twists, even though it's just 40 seconds, you know? And I feel like I've become a better writer because of that time constraint. Like, you know, you're like, oh, 40 seconds. I need to set like I have to lay the context down, right? Lay the foundation, introduce the characters, make sure people understand the characters and then still have an entire plot and that plot has to come and wrap and, and wrap all in 40 seconds. You don't have time for any fluff. You need to just go. Um, and so when videos are moving, that means that you've done all those things successfully. Wow. You broke it down for a lot of people that want to get into your space, which I think is cool. And then you also answered the question that I was going to ask you much later on about what advice or, or words of wisdom you offer somebody that wants to be in your space and you answer that. So answer this. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your voice? What's your true voice that represents who you really are artistically? Why is that your voice? And how did you find it? So I'll go, I'll, I guess I'll work backwards. So how I found it was life. You know, like I was not comfortable in my own skin all through school, you know, all through high school, 
a lot of through college and it, and it surprises people because obviously on paper, you know, I was pretty successful with things. Like I was a division one athlete. I was an all conference soccer player. I was at an Ivy league school. I was like, there was a lot of good things. I came from a great family, great parents, great sisters, but like, I really was uncomfortable with myself. Like I tried desperately to figure it out, you know, and it, it really stemmed from being when I was young, I had a lot of energy and I went to a school where a lot of energy wasn't necessarily a good thing. I had teachers uh, ask my parents to drug me and to give me uh, medication to calm me down because I was very, you know, sitting in class for seven hours in first grade. It was just not something I could do. Um, and so I got in trouble a lot because I got in trouble. Kids stayed away from me. Parents would tell their kids to stay away from me. And it kind of just went from that. And so even when I was in like middle school or high school and that nest that, that didn't necessarily happen anymore, there was still this stigma that was either reality or I felt it, you know what I mean? And I don't know, honestly, if many people felt that way still, but I know I thought they felt that way still. Um, and, you know, I know that I was desperately trying to find inclusion, even throughout my high school days, um, you know, and then it, it, that stemmed to, uh, you know, kind of this fear of, of when I did have a friend or if I had a girlfriend or if I had, I had a fear of losing it. I had like an abandonment fear because I was like, this might be the only friend because this is all I got because no one else likes me, you know, so, so it kind of, it was this spiral that was half reality, half my head kind of coping with maybe past realities. Um, and so it was this journey to really try to really consciously be comfortable because I never was. And it honestly is still sometimes a struggle where I, I'm, I need to, I know it's much better now. I feel very comfortable with my own skin now, but there's times where I almost get imposter syndrome, even with what I'm doing, where I'm like, wow, I have all these followers. That's not going to last. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's almost like, it's almost like imposter syndrome that, that dates back 20 plus years ago, um, where I need to actively almost be like, you're doing great. You're doing a good job. Like, good for you. Like you, you, you gain these followers. This is really, this is good for you. Like people like your videos, people, in, even when the views are bad, like, you know, oh, videos aren't doing well right now. Doesn't mean they hate you. Doesn't mean, and, and, and I almost have to talk myself through it still. Um, and that, so, so on one hand, the real me is very comfortable. And on the other hand, that real me has to talk to past me as past me tries to come and encroach on my personal space. <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, so it's, it's definitely, it's not super straightforward, but I feel like that's just life for everyone. Everyone deals with some sort of demon. Everyone deals with some sort of trauma. Everyone deals with some sort of uh, inner struggle, whatever that may look like. And for me, it is that. It dates very far back from first grade, kindergarten, stuff like that. And it dates back from really this childhood of never feeling like I was fitting in because I was super high energy, because I was really kind of weird. So even when I was an athlete, and getting recruited for division one sports, I wasn't in with the jocks, right? Even when I was doing film, I wasn't in with the art students. I always was kind of, I felt like on an island. And again, I'm open to the fact that that might've not been the case to the degree that I thought it was. But when you are not comfortable and you're feeling this trauma, this 10 years of trauma or 15 years of, of trauma uh, of not feeling like you belong, you definitely put everything under a microscope. And so uh, even when I started content creation at 26, where I was a, an adult with confidence, feeling good about life, you know, it still took years to really be able to be okay with just being myself on camera and just kind of not necessarily feeling the need to pick and choose what I say and how I say it and, you know, obviously, focusing on being respectful and not being stupid, but like, you know, making sure that I'm not trying to be an online persona. I want online persona Tyler to be the same as regular Tyler. Um, and, and it is an ongoing process. Yeah, it is an ongoing process, but it seems like you figured it out. It's like, Jesus, because like, you, you know, you, you do have a responsibility for all the, those jocks in America that, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. They don't know how to put their socks on. No, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm, 
<laughs> Please don't kill me. No, I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> no way. No, you you do have a responsibility because you, you know you you you're, you're still a trailblazer. You're still in a, 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 a um in a, in a uh, ecosystem that's relatively new in the entertainment industry. They know nothing about what they're doing. <laughs> They don't, they don't even know how to attack you guys. I'm, I'm laughing. And then you're and then you're a part of an ecosystem that can just like take over fashion week. It's like, <laughs> like I've it never is, seen it. Is, yeah. <laughs> it just takes it over. It's like, damn, we just took that little shit over. I love it. Um, and, and it's empowering to see for me. I love it. Because, they, you know, here they are la laughing about you and you just took the shit over. Same thing they talk about streaming services. You know, they'll never get awards. Then, you know, Netflix is like dominating the Emmys, dominating the, Glo the Golden Globes. It's like, shut up. It's like, you know, the naysayers and the baby boomers or people who are out of touch. I don't care what generation you are. You, you, if, you, if, you're not a, if you're not in touch, you're out of touch. It is what it is. I don't care how old you are. Um, you, you know, it is what it is. But the great thing with you is, is that um, you're open and it seems like you're open minded and you're not cutting off any ties and you're, you, you know, you're rolling with the punches. Speaking of which, what's next for you? Like what's in what's in your um, your next line of sight? Honestly, like I said, I mean, other than other than trying to get into writing in some capacity and, and trying to create some other like whether it be a web series or miniseries, other than that, I feel like the industry is a little bit hurry up and wait, you know, so I want to continue to create um, in the meantime, while I, you know, and I've been working on projects on the side and working on screenplays and ideas and this and that. And I do want to get to the point where either, um, you know, where I'm able to use everything I've learned for five years, six years, however long it takes and be able to spin it into not necessarily traditional media, but I would love to do something long form. I'm known for this short form content. I want to prove to myself that I can create something, whether it's 30 minute episodes, whether it's a movie, you know, and, and really pitch it and try to get it sold and, and see if I can, um, you know, do both. Yeah. And are you open to like the NFT space? I can totally see you being like a guest panelist or a person in that world. Are you open to that space? Oh, and another thing, do you accept NFT or uh, um, cryptocurrency as a form of payment for some of your jobs that you, that you have, your assignments that you have on the social media platforms? Uh, I, so I've never, I've never had payment in the form of crypto. That being said, I do trust that crypto is a, I, I trust crypto more than NFT for sure. I feel like crypto is, I don't think it will, I'm not of the belief it will ever replace like the U S dollar, for example, or, or more. I do think that they will coincide and they will live together. Um, I look at crypto very similarly to how I look at stocks. I mean, they're not tangible. They are, they are a symptom of the, uh, of the confidence that consumers have. NFTs, on the other hand, I, I, I look at slightly more like a fad. I don't know enough about NFTs, or I know less about NFTs than I know about, know about crypto. So I don't ever want to make a sweeping statement like it is a fad. But it, from where I know, sit right now, I look at crypto as much more legitimate than NFTs, but that is also admittedly coming from someone that knows the bare minimum. I know enough to get by with NFTs. I certainly don't know the intricacies as well as I know about the blockchain and crypto and, and, and the actual inner workings of, of that space. Fair enough. Yeah, the NFT space is just like, you, you kind of like got to throw yourself in it. And you got to mm -hmm. talk to people and you got to go to conferences. You got to run the pack. So we do a lot of conferences and we cover a lot of um, conferences like NFT.NYC, NFT.LA, NFT Miami. And then we did, we were a part of the we were media sponsored NFT VIP. So that was interesting. Um, a very uh, eclectic group of people who are in that space, particularly people who rep represent marginalized communities um, in the artist the artist world because NFTs are like digital art but NFTs are also representative of uh, those tokens represent services to be you know rendered um, and tangible items as well so a lot of people it is a space we have to um, you know re-educate ourselves on and and possibly mm -hmm. reconfigure the discussion on it I feel like it's all over the place I feel like NFTs to me and crypto are kind of like hand in hand because that blockchain technology is being used to, um, you know, kind of stamp the uh, NFT or mint it. So it's a lot going on. 
And then there's so many different blockchains and it's confusing. And then, like you said, there's a crypto market versus the stock market. And then there's mm-hmm. a digital dollar that's coming out. It's just so much. For me, NFTs, you know, cryptocurrency for me, rather, it was like Western Union. You know, it's like money you can't see. <laughs> yeah, no, no, and that's true. And I feel like with, like you said, with NFTs and art, that, I find that there's like two pretty distinct versions of NFTs, right? And, and that's mm-hmm. where I lose the faith. NFT in, in the sense of an artist producing something and selling it as a digital form of art, I don't think it's going anywhere. I think the where I grow skeptical is when you have these mass produced corporation, corporation NFTs that feel like almost like taking something and just flooding the market with it and being like, this is valuable because we say it is, right? And I think that that's, that there's a distinct difference in my mind, again, not coming from someone that knows a ton about it, um, but the but the artists, like the art space NFT and the, you know, look at this exclusive thing. There's only a thousand of them, but we could, you know, we're saying there's a thousand, you know, that I think those are two very different spaces. I look at the NFT A and NFT B and the NFT A, I feel like has a very solid place in the world. It's those, it's that, it's that flooding of the market of just random NFTs, especially when there was, um, remember the Charlie bit my finger YouTube video? Like that was sold as like an NFT and it was sold for like 40 grand, 50 grand or hundred grand or something. I was like, no, that's dumb. That's not sustainable. That's just not something. You can't just take any old YouTube video from early 2000s, say it's an NFT and sell it for six figures. That's not a sustainable market. Um, but having an artist make an NFT and like, you know, like that to me looks more like a sustainable version of it, if that makes sense. So I think my skepticism comes from the fact that it's a bit of the wild west right now and it doesn't seem to have found a, a really solid, and that's what crypto was 10 years ago. I mean, crypto was the wild west and now it has, it's kind of found its lane a little bit. And I feel like for NFTs to do that, it's going to have to figure out what it is it's trying to do as a space. And I think for me, where I trust it more is that art space, less the everything else is going on with its space. I like it. I like it for um, for option number C. Um, and then there's a D for all of the above. But C for me is people who use it to um, attach it to like an ideal for a show or a song or a destination. So it's like you almost own a piece of that, the publishing, you have the rights to it, or you created this beautiful bottle encrusted with Selrashi crystals and you wanna you know, have it marked as or deemed as the one and only. So for me, I like the analogy of Mona Lisa. It's a tangible piece of art and it kind of like stamps it and mints it and says, this is the original. So I don't need some little white man that went to, I don't know, Pepperdine University <laughs> to tell me that this is a real piece of art. You know, I, I see, I see the, you know, the blockchain says in 1984, before the world even became a world, you know what I'm saying? Like whatever, yeah. that, that, that's the real bottle or oh, that's the real painting. So I feel like that's, that's, that's where, I think that's where it's going to really come in. And so I feel as, a like verifi- as like a verification yes, process, like verif- that yes, would make, like, that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a verification. And I feel like the person that owns that video of that guy cracking jokes or this person doing X, Y, Z, that's going to, um, you know, that person, their, their lineage or their family for that generational wealth, that's where that's going to probably come in, you know, a hundred more years from now, there'll be like the, the Trinidad. I want to be like three internets combined in one. Hopefully this mm-hmm. comes through and I'll make some money off of it. That's it. <laughs> the Trinidad, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the, um, the NFT space um, makes more sense um, when like Prada does a, a, a launch or Diesel does a launch of like 40 shirts and people would sell out. That makes cool sense as a capsule collection. You'll never see it again. Yeah. Um, it makes sense when like you want to use it in the meta world, in a virtual reality world, where you're playing Oculus or you have that little game or you get your little glo- your goggles on and you're in a space going to a, a, a digital version of Starbucks and a digital train and you got to, or you decide to take a digital Lexus. It makes sense like that, you know, because you have to yeah. buy the clothes for that avatar and that character. So that's when it comes a little commercial, but it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. I haven't played with it yet. I'm trying to save it for later because I know yeah. I'm going to get lost in that world because I know people are like, you got to come have, you know, lunch me at the, I'm like, I'm not doing a damn digital drink. <laughs> I mean, I got to try it. I haven't yet. I got to try it. I got to try it too. I'm lying. Just I'm to lying. say I did. <laughs> I'm lying. But that's so great. 
I'm so happy that we get the opportunity to speak with you today. Is there anything else that you want to talk to, any community service involvement that you lend your name in support of, or any other um, things we haven't uh, talked about that you want to speak to before we end our conversation, which is a lovely conversation. I think people are le learning a lot. I feel like you're a plethora, and you're so of information, and you're knowledgeable on so many different fronts. Um, I think it's just crazy that, um, and I think it's, it's great because it's like you, you created this whole other space, and it's creating a whole other dialogue, and I feel like the Ivy Leaguers that are in this space, we don't even talk. Like, I mean, I need I need this all to come out, come out of the Ivy League closet. <laughs> no, that's like, like yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I'm, 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 I'm like, you're Ivy Leaguer. It's like, you're crazy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm coming after all of you guys. So I feel like, you know, Ty, you have to help me find other Ivy Leaguers, because there's a lot of them in this space that are, like, proven to be, like, forces to be reckoned with. So, I mean, uh, kudos to you. My hats are off to you. My hats are off. You know, such bravery and such conviction, you know, when your career came to a somewhat abrupt, you know, stop with soccer um, when you did that, when you had that injury. Um, people don't understand Division One is, you know, that's the highest level, duh. Um, I didn't know that. So I'm just educating people on it because I had to figure that out when I was, when my roommate was a basketball player at Cornell. Um, you know, I just, you know, he was just, I was like, hello, you know, I wake up at one o'clock in the morning, he's on a bus. So it's like, you know, or on a private airplane, I'm like, where are you going? Like, you know, CIA. So it's just very interesting, yeah. you know, seeing that world before my eyes. But it's like you said, it's such a rigorous platform, a program. And now you're doing, you know, social media and you're exploring all these options. I feel like with you, you know, you, you are a trailblazer. You're a trailblazer within our community of non-traditional careers. You know, Ivy League schools are, you know, Cornell is known for labor law, hospitality, engineering, architecture, things that make the world go round. And now uh, the things that really make the world go around, like arts and culture that you're a part of, that I wish our programs to get a little bit more intensified on with, you know, in, in, you know, in uh, communications and publishing, those things in content creation that we need a program like that at Cornell. And I feel like, you know, you and myself and others, we bring this to the forefront. They're gonna they're gonna open their eyes and they're gonna and they're gonna give some more energy to it. Cause at one point Cornell had the most library system, the biggest library system. You know, they yep. had, Cornell has seven freaking libraries on campus. Like who the fuck? Look what the that, that, that's I mean, when I lost. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot. That's a lot of libraries. No, I agree with everything you're saying. And I mean it's something that I would love to uh, you know be a part of helping move that move the needle on that because that's uh it's something that it's important. It really is. And obviously we're biased. We're in this space, but you know, we can see the importance more firsthand, but on lending our voices to, you know, people that might not see the importance of it the same way I get told on a regular basis, get a real job. Like, I mean, from some troll here and there in my comments, it's like, to me, what you're doing, what I'm doing, you know, the arts, the comedy publication, stuff like that is just as essential to our existence, if not more so than uh, a lot of necessary, more traditional quote unquote jobs. So, you know, I think that um, that is an important thing to continue to express that. Yeah, it is. So thank you so much, Tyler. I'm gonna, I, I would love to stay in touch. Um, keep in touch with us. I'll speak to your team, your camp, you know, your ever so growing camp. I think it's so awesome. You're, you're so on it, bro. Um, as a recent graduate and you're so like you're such an inspo to a lot of younger people and some of the gen z's and people in your age group and even the ones coming up the, i don't know what you call them w's <laughs> i can't keep up the the the, 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 the n-dubs the new world order um kids because <laughs> gen z is getting old they're like 14 yes, now <laughs> yeah i know right what's happening so Right, I know. Like, you, oh, you're so out of it. You're so old. Like, you know, but for you, I mean, the sky's the limit. I'm so excited for your success. But if I have any opportunities coming your way, if I have anybody, anything is anything in mind, I'll reach out to you. Um, I think that what you're doing is so great. And I, and I love your um, your tenacity and your perseverance and also your dedication. And you, be, you, you know, you having a plan, a plan of action and strategy. It's like, that's all I hear when you speak. It's just A, B, C. But it's like, no, I don't, I don't you know, there's strategy, there's strategy. And I feel like most people, they don't have a strategy. They don't have a business plan. They don't have anything written down or anything. You know, I can tell that you have a a vision board there's a white chalkboard there's something around your house that's like you read every day that you see 
that reminds you that you are the next. So I'm kudos to you. Yay, Tyler. Appreciate Thanks it. For stopping by. Thanks for stopping by being a big red bear. You know what I'm saying? I got to hold it down for Cornelians. I'm so excited for you. Um, I'm just so happy that it's just, I'm so happy that people that, that I'm not saying we're all that back chasing with the Ivy League. No, it's just another community of people that mm -hmm. were, went to school together and people don't really understand the dynamics of Cornell and how we have, you know, Ujima and Awego and we have these different residence halls that have have different um, themes to them. So one is for just about music with jam and there's West Campus and North Campus and they have different energies. It's a microcosm truly of a small city and we're on a hill, you know, it's just, a, a, it was a cool way to just, you know, just to experience the world. And my first real experience of people from New York and meeting white Puerto Ricans. I never knew what a white Puerto Rican was until <laughs> <laughs> And she said, no, -uh, I ain't in Rosa Perez, I'm a white Puerto Rican. I said, okay, girl. <laughs> Okay. Like, okay, now I know. Now I know. Right. Okay. You know, I never really, I heard you making music, but you know, when you go to Cornell, you hear that, you know, everybody, do, 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 do. it's like, nah, 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 nah. You know, I'm like, oh my God, turn that down. You know, your body oh, gyrating, you don't know why you move. And like you said, growing around that weather, you know, that six inches, eight inches, 12 inches of snow, two is two feet of snow, you, you know, classes cancel. And then people don't also realize that Cornell is still operating on that bell curve. Well, your GPA is weighted. So, you know, a 2.9 yep. at Cornell is not, it's not a 2.9 anywhere else. So um, don't get it twisted. It's probably a 3.2. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so thanks for sharing your experiences. Um, I'm sure people are going to want to reach out to you. You know, Tyler Regan, at Tyler Regan on Instagram. I love your TikTok. It's fun. And it seems like you're very active on there. So I can't wait to delve back into that. But thank you, thanks again for stopping yeah. by. We really appreciate you. And we really look forward to working with you and hearing about some more of your great projects to come. Yeah, no, I appreciate you taking the time. Obviously, super thorough. And if you guys have any questions for this particularly, let me know. But if there's anything in the future, if you guys want to even uh, just... If you're ever in LA, you want to link up. If you ever want to just, just let me know. Keep me in the loop with stuff because uh, I want to stay involved with everything you guys are doing. Yeah, same here. So on that note, you um, what are you doing this weekend? Anything fun? Or are you just chilling out? So right now we're doing a, a road trip. So we are, I'm in a, I'm in an Airstream right now. So I'm actually in Arkansas of all places. I'm in the Ozark Mountains. Uh, oh, and yeah, I've been to Ozarks. I've been to Ozarks. Yeah, it's cool, right? It's beautiful. It's, it's so beautiful. pretty. It actually right reminds now, me of a Cornell. It really just yes. reminds me of that like landscape. Um, but yeah, so we're doing that. We've been we started June fifth. Uh, we renovated this airstream, and uh, basically from June fifth to December seventh, doing this road trip. So we're coming to an end. I mean, we have October, November, um, really left, uh, and uh, we still have after this. It's Oklahoma, Santa Fe, uh, Colorado Springs. Moab, Utah, Vegas, Napa, Santa Barbara, Anaheim, LA. Um, so still got some spots. Uh, so kind of exploring, like I said, I always did a lot of uh, international travel, but I've never really, really did a full deep dive into my own country. So this is the opportunity to do that. So renovated this Airstream. It's a 1976 Airstream, renovated it, never gone camping in my life, but whatever, first time for everything and, and just started the trip. So that's, so what I'm doing this weekend is, being in Arkansas and then Sunday going to Oklahoma. So got to kind of every weekend's always like a weird new weekend during this trip. Yo, yo. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I, dr I drove across country a few times. It's amazing to see the country and um, very interesting as a marginalized community member to be, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going straight to my room. <laughs> yep. I'm going to go uh, here. I'll be in there. And if you need me, I'm staying in there. Right, right. But the airstreams, people don't, those little silver looking bullet trailers, those things are beautiful when you restore them, of course, and they're huge. You know, people oh, yeah. are living in them right now. It's all about the tiny home and take, you know, and sustainability and being eco friendly and, you know, lowering your carbon footprint. And I feel like that's awesome that you're taking time to learn the country because I, I got to do that. And I, and I, and, um, I, I'm just like, I'm floored. I did it once or twice, I believe, in my life. And it's just, you know, just, just just drive across country and see the way people live in America and the way you live and the way you're living now. I'm, I'm pretty sure you're like, ooh, I'm, I'm glad I picked this career choice. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much. Um, enjoy your travels. Safe travels this weekend. Um, don't get into too much trouble. And we'll, we'll, we'll be I'll checking try. you out. All right. Thanks, Tyler. All right. Have a good one.
Diese 